Okay. Um, yeah, so we've just been dealing with the um, issue of the shortfall. Uh, is there anyone else, anyone else on this side of the room has anything else to say about shortfall? Mr. Keir. Yeah, thank you, sir. I was a bit confused this morning, but I did cover the, the figures this morning. Um, uh, again, it's in our um, uh, submissions. I, I won't labour the point, but um, clearly we take issue with the inclusion of uh, student housing in the completion uh, figures uh, for the reasons set out in our uh, submissions. Um, and when you uh, exclude the um, student units, of course, the, the shortfall becomes, or the, the backlog becomes uh, much higher than the council uh, have indicated and uh, based on 790 as I said when you strip out the housing sorry the student housing um, you need to include 103 uh, sorry beg your pardon uh, 73 uh, dwellings per year from the beginning of the plan period um, and again just on uh, Mr. Corsia's point I, I can't accept what he's saying either I mean uh, he seems to be implying there's no housing requirement from 2012 and therefore you can't assess any shortfall or else he's implying that the completions are the housing requirement. But uh, either way, when you look at completion figures, particularly for, 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 um, for example, 2013-14, 345 net units completed for a city the size of York it just doesn't make sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the council for um, any final comment that they might have on the point, but it, before I do, is there anything else on this side? Very good, thank you. Um, anything else from the council's perspective on this? There's only a short um, point, uh, sorry, short response to Mr. Keogh in relation to student completions. Um, the approach that we take is set out in the housing monitoring uh, reports that we referred to earlier, EXCYC3. But in short, um, we include within our net completions student accommodation where it is off-campus uh, off and purpose-built student accommodation, and we apply the necessary adjustment to it in terms of converting from bed spaces to units, um, in terms of counting self-contained units rather than bed spaces. Yes, unless I'm very much mistaken, <laughs> which I rarely am, uh, I think that brings us to the happy news um, that we have covered 2.3 and I think 2.4. Is that right? Um, we haven't yet, though. Um, <coughs> talked about the mixing and matching um, issue that I don't think that I, that I did want to hear about. Or, or did I hear that and I've already forgotten? Well, th that's partly dealt with by what I said this morning about what government policy requires and, 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 and making adjustments. The, the same point arises. If you've, got, if you've got staggered local plans and local plan reviews, um, some of which within transitional and some are not, that inevitably you have different methodologies applied, and that's simply a matter of, of government policy. And you've heard what we've said already today about making adjustments uh, to take account of local circumstances and any necessary um, uh, upward adjustments. Um, so far as Selby's review is concerned, of course, that's at a very early stage. We don't know what they're going to come out with. And it's entirely possible that the standard methodology is going to change by the time they get to their Reg 19 plan anyway, uh, and we simply don't know. The, the, the means government policy devises to deal with this is, as you know, paragraph 33 of the current framework, which is to require 
a review within the first five years to see whether or not... Um, you preempted my next question, Mr. Elvin. Yeah. And, and so there is the, the um, uh, government acknowledges that the transitional provisions may require a review. They don't necessarily require a review because we don't know what's going to be thrown up by Selby in due course. Um, and the, uh, and that, is, that is the approach uh, which the current framework takes to ensuring that the HMA needs uh, are met in full where you've got plans operating under different methodologies. So my, my response to your point is that it lies entirely within the operation of, of current government policy. And, 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 and bearing in mind, sorry, <laughs> and bearing in mind that the, uh, the two uh, constituent authorities of the HMA as, as defined, i.e. Selby and York, are both meeting uh, their own housing need, i.e. covering the whole of the HMA, as we've defined it. Um, the fact that different methodologies apply doesn't mean they're not meeting the full need. It just means that the application of government policy to the derivation of those figures uh, uh, is, is likely to differ but that will have to be aligned in due course for the reasons I've already indicated. Yes, you just anticipated my next question, uh, which was whether or not, uh, where you have two different methods applying, does that lead to a risk um, that need isn't being met? Um, you, you say no. Uh, no, and the other point I want to make, which actually touches on something in 2.5, is that because we have several large strategic sites uh, which will take time to deliver, um, we, we've got a situation where some of the housing of those strategic sites will be delivered outside of the local plan period, um, which is why there appears to be, uh, I, I think, a, a point that you make at 2.5e, uh, potential over provision in the light of our OAN, but that's because we have to allocate the sites to get the numbers for the OAN, but the sites are larger than the OAN requires, but that is because those sites can't deliver entirely within the plan period. They can deliver what's required for the plan within the plan period, but we've got extra flexibility and robustness for long-term greenbelt boundaries because of that particular issue. So there is flexibility and headroom built in appreciate on the basis of our figures and others take issue with that but that's how we see matters and we hope that that commends itself to you anyone else um, want to speak on the mixing and matching issue Very good. So I can, I can also indicate that I can give you fairly rapid answers to your 2.5 issues. We've touched on some of them already. If your concern is to make sure we get to 2.6 in good time, if it appears that there's going to be an enormous debate over 2.5, it may be better to put that over to Thursday for the reserve day or Monday if you think there's time to deal with it on Monday. But I could have a go at 2.5 and telling you what our position is, and you can see to what extent that there is any significant issue raised by that, because the, certainly the representations we receive don't really focus on 2.5, either that or they're consequential on what's already been said. Um, yeah, I, I was actually wondering whether there was merit in taking 2.6 first before 2.5. Happy to do so. Does that seem like a good idea around the table? Absolutely. Everyone's stunned. <laughs> I see some kind of reaction that, that would that would assist. Right, marvellous. Right, um, we'll go then to the question of the housing requirement. And first of all, and non-sequentially, um, to question 2.6. Um, will the housing requirement 
ensure that the need for affordable housing will be met? So, the, uh, in terms of a response, uh, it doesn't automatically require uh, a local authority to meet their affordable housing need in full. However, oh, that's, sorry, that wasn't quite what I was asking. Okay. I, first of all, I want to kind of understand the, the situation, what, what the factual sort of position would, would be, in your view, anyway. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Schmar analysis indicates a need for 573 net additional households uh, per year requiring support in meeting their housing need. Uh, that is based on the assumption that no household should... Sorry, if I could just... Um, uh, do, do forgive me, Mr. McCall. Um 573 net additional, um, you say. Um, is that every year of the plan period or, or something different? So how, how it's calculated is, uh, is on an annual basis. So this year it will be 573 and we would expect that to be the same number uh, for, for each year of the remainder of the plan. However, we have, uh, as I said, it was based on a 30% uh, income threshold. Uh, we've con concluded that it was uh, not appropriate to directly compare the need identified in the analysis with the demographic projections or the overall uh, housing need, uh, as they are calculated in different ways, as Mr Gardner uh, suggested earlier. Uh, and also, having regards to the King's Lynn case, which suggested that there wasn't a need for a, a mechanistic uplift. However, that's not to say that the local authority won't be making a substantial contribution to affordable housing need. Um, yeah, I'm not sure you've answered the question. Um, so I'll put it again. Um, will the housing requirement ensure that the need for affordable housing will be met? Uh, in essence, not in full, but it will be the council will be uh, producing enough affordable housing to make a substantial contribution to meeting the affordable housing need as much as it possibly can. Uh, further to that, uh, we would expect potentially some reductions in affordable housing need going forward as the adjustment for affordability and uh, economic growth uh, seeks to reduce house prices in relation to earnings. Uh, that would mean, in effect, that... Okay. So I've slightly lost track of where it was there. So, uh, in essence, what the what we're seeking to do is meet as much of the affordable housing need as possible. Uh, there are also other ways of delivering uh, new affordable housing, but besides uh, new build development on market-led schemes. Uh, policy H10 also requires, for example, the provision of financial contributions on sites smaller than 15 dwellings. Uh, that's not included at this moment in time within the Council's projections of affordable housing delivery. Uh, the Council do anticipate, however, that overall there will be 3,500 additional affordable homes to be provided uh, within uh, the strategic and non-strategic housing allocations, uh, and that equates to approximately 25% of the total number of dwellings. Uh, 3,500 additional affordable homes I heard um, through allocations. Was that, that right? Over, over the, uh, is that over, over the plan period? Is that to 
um, 2032-33 or to 37-38? I think that's to 2033 in terms of the plan period, and it was based on allocations, um, both strategic and non-strategic. Um, it doesn't include any extant planning consents or any affordable housing provision um, that come through any windfalls. So can, um, can everyone hear all right? Sorry. Uh, can, can I just ask that you say that again? Yes, sorry. It was based on um, a, per a percentage of affordable homes um, from the strategic and non-strategic allocations in the plan. So it was working on a midpoint of 25% because policy H10 seeks for a 20% affordable housing provision on brownfield sites and 30% on greenfield sites. So it was taking a, a projection, an estimated provision from that source through the policy mechanism. I just wanted to take a step back. Um, the need, um, I think Mr. McColgan told me, um, stems from uh, the, the Schmar. That's where, is it, we find the 573 figure. Um, can you remind me that the Schmar, that's, is that 2016? Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, should I be worried at all that it's 2016 um, and not more contemporary? Um, I wouldn't imagine that, that there would be any fundamental change in any estimate of affordable housing need using this methodology. Um, essentially, the, the affordability is, is based on looking at households being able to access the bottom end of the housing market, which is typically the private rented sector. Um, Unlike, you know, unlike house prices, I suspect that private rents have, have probably risen, but at a similar sort of level to incomes they have nationally. So I would have thought that, that whilst clearly a, you know, a re-look at the affordable housing need using that method, which is the same method that's set out uh, in, well, actually in, in more recent planning practice guidance, is, is unlikely to give any, any substantially different figure. Um, yeah, um, mental arithmetic has never been my my strong point. So, um, in, in terms of um, need being met, I, I think uh, Mrs. Macefield, did you did you mention a percentage? Um, if you did, I haven't noted it. Sorry, yes, I said that the projections were based on a midpoint of twenty five percent, which is recognising that policy H ten of the plan. Um, stipulates a 20% affordable housing contribution for brownfield and 30% for greenfield. A 25% contribution? Yes, sorry. Um, that's a little curious, isn't it? This is about the allocations. Um, yeah, is that right? The 25%, this is, this is in relation to the allocations. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, you, you, well, you know which ones are greenfield and which ones are brownfield, don't you? So I, I, I wonder why you, why you took a, a midpoint between the, the 20 and the 30. Okay, well, I, 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 don't, I have no idea how, what, what kind of difference that makes. I'm afraid I don't have that figure to hand, but I can certainly check that for you. Uh, yes, please. You know, I'd, I'd like to be kind of assured with a reasonable sort of degree of accuracy um, about 
the level of affordable housing that would be coming forward through um, allocations and, and other sources. And it just seems to me a slightly odd thing to, um, to have done, really, when, when you, you, know, you know which are the greenfield and the brownfield sites, don't you? So. Yes, I'll check that for you and provide the figures. Grateful, thank you. Um, yes, sadly, though, that's not the percentage that I, that I had in mind. What, 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 I, what I want to get clear in my head is um, a picture of the extent to which the need of, for affordable housing would be met by this plan. Are we talking about somewhere near all of it, half, um, or, or what? Well, so on the, on the basis, um, the estimate with that midpoint of 25%, which, which obviously we're going to look at, was around 3,500 affordable homes, which would equate to around 219. Yeah, this, is where, this is where my mental arithmetic inadequacies come into play. So around 219 homes per annum, affordable homes per annum. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, I think what's going to be helpful to me is if the council can do a relatively small piece of homework um, that looks at that in a little bit more detail um, and does separate out uh, the contributions from Brownfield, contributions from Greenfield, which ought, by my reckoning, bring you to um, a more accurate estimate, insofar as one can be accurate with these things. Yeah, yes, we can do that, although uh, I should stress that that 3,500 figure is just the supply from uh, allocated uh, sites. And uh, are, yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you about other sources, actually. Uh, yeah. So could you tell me about uh, other potential sources of affordable housing delivery? Yeah, so there the could well, well, we don't, I don't think we can put a figure on it, but I'm looking to Rachel to confirm, but there will be, for example, additional affordable housing supply coming from commuted sums from developments under uh, 15 dwellings, uh, for example, and they'll be delivered principally through uh, schemes which will have a larger contribution than perhaps the policy uh, suggests should be the case. So it may well be that they are delivered through 100% affordable housing schemes, but again, that's not something at this stage that we uh, know of in terms of an exact number. Help if we put all of this in, in the note you've just asked for, then you've got the figures. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in essence, what I'm driving at here um, is I'm, I'm trying to find out whether or not the council um, is doing all it realistically could um, to strive to meet the need for um, affordable housing. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware, of course, that some authorities, um, for example, um, include the possibility of exception sites um, in their local plans. Is that the case here? Sorry for the delay. I was just looking for the right policy reference. Yeah, we, um, in the plan, policy GB4 is the exception sites for affordable housing in the green belt. <coughs> and uh, yeah, just so I don't have to bother grabbing it to hand, can you just tell me briefly what it says? Yes, sorry. Um, it sets out that the development of affordable housing on exception sites in the Greenbelt is not an appropriate development, and there's a set of criteria where it will be considered appropriate, which looks at um, contributing to meeting identified need as set out in an up-to-date uh, up assessment, um, that the affordable housing is retained at an affordable price for future eligible households in perpetuity, etc., that it's 
um, within a suitable distance set at 800 metres of a defined settlement limit or well related, etc. So there's a number of criteria set out in the policy. Yeah, sure. O okay. Um, so, um, in answer to my question, then um, about other potential sources um, of affordable housing delivery, um, you're, you're telling me that um, exception sites is, is one of them. And, and, and we, you know, in, in due course, um, we will look at policy GB4 as part of um, the phase two hearings. We'll look at the detail of that then. Mr. Barnes. Thank you, sir. Um, I think what we've just heard is that the council haven't done the second part of paragraph 29. Um, the PPG um, because A, they don't know how much affordable housing the plan is going to deliver. B, they don't know what the up-to-date affordable housing need is. Um, as the points I raised earlier about the changing evidence of need, um, obviously now increasingly worsening um, lower quartile affordability ratios, but also in the, past, in the recent years, fairly poor um, delivery of affordable housing, um, which is set out in other people's statements around the room. Um, so yeah, does, the question is, I guess, is does it does the plan respond to paragraph 47 of the MPPF to um, meet the full objectively assessed needs for market and affordable housing? Um, at this stage, not because we, we don't know that evidence. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, sir. I wonder if I may ask a question to help me understand all this. Um, all the talk is about affordable housing. But apparently there's no specific provision in the plan for social housing. And I would have thought that in this plan that should pay a very large part. Surely the most pressing need for housing is for those who are on the housing list, those who are in bed and breakfast accommodation, or sadly in York sleeping on the streets together with other people who are perhaps low wage earners who cannot afford to purchase or people who just don't wish to purchase. Uh, the only schemes uh, in the plan that have been currently brought forward uh, which are York Central, the Nestle site ST17 and the Monk's Cross site ST8, none of those as far as I'm aware include any need uh, or provision for social housing. There is an innovative scheme on the Heweth Gasworks site H1 for 700 flats uh, to be for rental only and not for purchase. But this is being brought forward by a private developer and again, uh, I don't see can include any social housing. Now everybody in York knows that affordable housing is completely unaffordable for the people I've been referring to. How are they to be catered for? And if, uh, then if it's not in the plan, then I would say that makes the plan flawed and unsound, apart from being a failure of the citizens of York. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Thanks, sir. Just a couple of quick points. Um, just first of all, about the adequacy of um, relying on a 2016 dated Schmar. Um, I think Mr. Gardner suggested, well, anecdotally, incomes have probably gone up nationally, so therefore that's kind of outweighed the increase in rents. Well, actually, looking at the data from the, the lower quartile house price ratio which is available for York and which they've referred to. If you look at the, the LQ, so that's kind of the entry level um, housing, 2016 for York it was 8.97, 2017 it was 9.06, 2018 it was 9.41. So it's clearly worsening. 
So homes are becoming less affordable in York. So clearly, house prices are outstripping increases in incomes. So, you know, we've got a lot of information about rising house prices and all the rest of it. I do believe it probably needed updating. So that's one point. My second point, where um, Jill Home was suggesting, well, they're done in totally different ways, and therefore you can't really say we're going to provide 573. Well, if, if I could just walk through the PPG, I mean, the relevant paragraph is 029, so it's 2A029, which clearly tells us how we should factor in affordable housing needs into the OAN. And it basically says, the total affordable housing needs should be considered in the context of its likely delivery as a proportion of mixed market and affordable housing developments, given the probable percentage which you've discussed. An increase in the total housing figures included in the local plan should be considered where it could help deliver the required number of affordable homes. And as you've already heard, there's no way you're going to be able to deliver 573 affordable dwellings in a target of 790. I mean, that's 73% of the entire OAN. And I haven't considered it, any uplift it, to it. If it helps, Mr Robinson, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the sentence that you've just read out, I think verbatim, um, it is the one that uh, prompted my question. I do, I do apologise. Um, <laughs> it's a clear why. The reason I've done that is because it links back to the King's Lynn judgment, which I think they referenced. Um, I'm not suggesting they should provide the whole amount, which would be about 1,910 at 30%. Um, but there should be at least um, some form of uplift should be considered um, to meet this need for affordable housing, even in part. And the failure to do so renders the OEN unsound as a result. On a pedantic point, is it the OAN or is it the requirement? I would suggest it's the requirement. Grateful, thank you. Uh, yeah, if it helps, so do I. Uh, so it's Mr. Austin Fell, sir. That's, that's fine. In the farthest point away. Um, so just to sort of pick up on, on some of those points that have been made, and it does come with some concern that the council simply don't seem to have much of a handle on, on this item, given that we're at this stage of the examination. But we will await eagerly new information provided with the council and take a view on it then. Um, under the 2012 framework, clearly the starting point has to be paragraph 49. You know, it is within their direction to meet the full objectively assessed need for market and affordable housing. And, and as we've heard, that figure is quite considerable. Um, if we were to follow the, the case law that has ensued since 2012, King's Lynn does give that direction to uh, provide flexibility. But the question has to be, sir, and as you've already alluded to, could the council go further in meeting that need in full? Now, we've heard from the council that there is currently a contingent of within the region of around 3,500 affordable homes that are going to be provided over the plan period. But whilst that is set against the current need of 573, which we'd endorse, this is only equating to around 29% of the total um, affordable housing need. And that, sir, is quite significant in, in terms of its gap. And I think there needs to be further questions that need to be raised in order for that need to be met. Now, although the Council have um, brought uh, figures from DCLG into repute uh, earlier today in terms of completions. It's also worth bearing in mind that there are affordable housing statistics available which might assist in understanding the extent of delivery of affordable units over the last few years of the plan period and how much that contributes to a potential immediate shortfall. I'll draw your attention, sir, to table um, 1008C. And these are the live tables prepared by government, updated on an annual basis. Uh, and we can see, sir, that for York, between 2012 and 2018-19, where the data ends, there's been a total sum of 693 affordable dwellings to date. And that's barely, perhaps, over one year's worth of affordable housing supply. In the interest of affordable housing uh, delivery, um, we would 
encourage the council to ensure that not only a greater provision is made for affordable housing, but that shortfall is indeed met at the earliest opportunity. But so I, I bring this table to your attention to perhaps at least provide a bit of assistance in understanding what the balance of the requirement is, taking into account past affordables and future planned affordables. And perhaps if that could be fed into the council's emerging note, uh, that would be helpful as well. Mr. Lane. My, my apologies, I'll, I'll take Mr. Johnson first. Thank you, sir. Well, actually, all of the questions that I was going to raise, and in particular the one that was just raised then by Mr. Austin Fowl, is exactly the point that I wanted to make about let's look at the past track record. And as part of that, and it was a point made earlier with respect to the past completions, is that when you count student provision in your completions, and student provision doesn't deliver affordable housing, is that that's where you lose out on the figures in effect. And that's one of the biggest downfalls to including student provision as part of your past completions because there are no affordable housing within it. Only one other minor matter, which was I think Mr Anderson's point about whether or not there is any social housing and affordable housing in the um, strategic allocations, and just to assist the council on this matter, and no doubt you'll be aware of it anyway, is that there is social housing within the strategic allocations because the affordable housing element at the 30% is 30% of the provision in the strategic sites at least, and in particular on ST8, will be transferred to a housing association. So the reference to affordable housing is the same as social housing in that regard. May I just come back on that, sir? Well, just very briefly, I can't see how that can apply to houses that are sold on most of these sites, which are going to be developed by developers for sale to the public. If uh, I'll, I'll, I, can, can I deal with that immediately and say it's socially rented accommodation? Yeah, I, I don't think Mr. Anderson. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I know what the situation is here, but but perhaps if you, if you, for Mr. Anderson's benefit, could repeat it, Mr. Anderson. Yes, the, the uh, as uh, has been indicated, the uh, uh, social housing is included within the uh, uh, the housing requirement. Uh, there's an eighty twenty split, and it's socially rented accommodation, and so it isn't property for sale on some sort of uh, shared mortgage or some other form of arrangement. It's, it's rented accommodation. Mr Lane. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, my colleagues have uh, addressed most of the points I was going to make, sir, but I'd uh, just like to draw your attention to uh, the Mid-Sussex Local Plan Examination, uh, which is very similar to York. Here they were considering the affordable housing need and came to the conclusion that that need was so substantial uh, that it couldn't be delivered in the context of that plan. And I note that the inspector there, which was, I think, the same inspector who dealt with Guildford, states at paragraph 17, nonetheless, it was clear that the plan should try to meet as much as was reasonably possible of that affordable housing need. Now, just turning back a bit, it wasn't so long ago, sir, that this plan proposed to provide 867 dwellings so clearly there is scope for the council to provide more uh, of that affordable housing need than they're currently proposing to do which is 790 but bearing in mind in a very short period of time sir that the, the actual housing need for york when it comes to the standard method and they have to review their plan the housing need will be 1070 clearly the government consider that is a figure that they can provide in york and I don't, don't think that the council is doing enough. The other point that perhaps to look at is that 573 dwellings as a percentage of the 790 proposed is 72%. That's a big figure in proportion to what they're proposing to provide, sir. Thank you.
Um, as a reward for extreme patience, um, I'm going to go to Mrs. Fern um, and, and then to Mr. Canavan. Thank you, sir, for the change in direction around the room. Greatly appreciated. Um, I appreciate that there's a number of mechanisms that will bring forward affordable housing across York. Um, but I think the council will agree that the main one um, to bring forward affordable housing will be through the allocation sites. Um, my concern is in specifically in relation to the larger strategic sites. Um, and I think the developers and the, um, their representatives across the room will agree with me in saying that um, not all sites that are required to bring affordable housing forward do in the end. Um, that's largely on the grounds of viability. Um, so the council don't, don't at this moment in time um, have the ability to say that all of those strategic sites, which are large, Will, comf will bring forward affordable housing at that 30% or 20%, depending on whether it's brownfield or greenfield land. It's specifically in relation to the strate strategic sites because they have such a level of infrastructure and requirements to bring forward facilities and amenities um, and the sheer scale of housing that's proposed on them um, that really puts pressure on the affordable housing requirements and I was just wondering whether there's any um, scope within the requirement to um, mitigate for that moving forward. Um, how, how do you mean mitigate for that? Um, well, I suppose it's difficult um, because you don't know what's going to happen in the end with the planning applications on the allocation sites. Um, is there any form of um, allowance, shall we say, within the affordable housing requirement that allows for um, how can I put it allows for a um, a level of um, well a level of allowance um, in case we get to a position where those strategic sites are not found viable enough to bring forward affordable housing because affordable housing is always the first thing that is cut um, as a result of um, assessments during the planning application stages. Um, yeah, just on that, I mean, you, you won't be surprised um, to hear that I'm very familiar um, with, with the issues that can um, come about in relation to um, larger, larger sites um, and, and also what in real life uh, that can end up meaning uh, for contributions to um, affordable housing. Again, this, this is an issue that won't only be discussed today, because if we go on to phase two hearings, then as you would expect, um, I'll be looking at questions of, well, the affordable housing policy, for example, and whether the percentage that it's setting um, is, is right, and in direct connection with that, also looking at um, viability issues. So, Today isn't, today isn't the end of it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that and leave it there, I think. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that it will fall into phase two as well. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Canavan. Thank you, sir, and thank you for uh, changing direction, as, as was just mentioned, although having said that, most of the things I was going to say have already been said, so <coughs> excuse me, just ticking them off. Um, uh, the one outstanding point, I think, um, is to raise another CLG table, which is very exciting, uh, number 685, um, about the right to buy and the number of houses that have been lost over the last few years. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we heard earlier that... Uh, um, there is uh, that in the calculations there's a freeing up of stock but housing is lost at the same time so including that in the note might be useful to understand some context and I think in terms of um, what effect does actual delivery have or you know what will happen when we get to those viability tests one of the ways we can understand that is in seeing past performance um, and so the uh, affordable housing table that was mentioned plus the uh, net additional tables will help us to understand what has happened into what will um, and 
the final point was what impact will the delivery or the under delivery of affordable housing have on unmet <coughs> needs or needs and the potential for unmet needs um, going forward and almost getting back to paragraph 33 of the new MPPF in terms of when the needs are reorganised. Oh, of, of the what now, sorry? Uh, the new MPPF, uh, MPPF 2019, in terms of when needs are re uh, uh, reviewed and understood again and those needs and unmet needs are pushed out or they're um, accepted within the Greenbelt boundary. And I'm moving into the next question, so just putting a marker in there. Mr Grundy. Uh, thank you, sir. I've uh, three points. Um, firstly, regarding the, the 573 uh, affordable housing need that's been brought forward from the uh, 2016 Schmar. You asked the council at the outset, should you be concerned? I think the message from around the table is that you should be very concerned indeed about the length of time that that number has been around and also the fact that that is also projected forward to the end of the plan period. Um, the second point was a point that Mr Johnson noted on recent net delivery. Uh, and For, forgive me Mr Grundy, can I just check uh, again, can, can everyone hear? An issue. I, I don't know if it's the, the lateness of the hour, but perhaps um, uh, if I can ask people to, to return to um, best theatre voices. Sorry, I'm suffering from the tail end of a cold, which doesn't really help either, I'm afraid. Um, so, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Canada both referred to recent net delivery uh, and paragraph. 2.05 of our statement for carbon homes actually sets out new build delivery from table MHCLG table 1011C affordable, additional affordable housing supply detailed by local authority breakdown and we've compared that against table 685 annual right to buy sales and the, the picture since 2015-16 uh, is, is somewhat woeful uh, in terms of new build 15-16 was 100 uh, set against right to buy sales of 68 and net delivery of 32 units the following year 135 net additional new build affordable housing units right to buy sales of 79 net delivery of 56 affordable housing units 2017-2018 Net, uh, new build of 67 set against right to buy sales of 72 minus six net, I'm sorry minus five net delivery and since we issued our statement the latest figures for uh, 1819 have come out so just to refer to those new build delivery in 2017 eight sorry tw 2018 19 56 right to buy, buy sales of 74 net delivery of minus 18. So I think there is a great concern and a need to factor in the, the trajectory of rights to buy sales against new build delivery in the council's note so that we've got some good recent statistical delivery figures to assess how things are like to move going forward. The final point I'd like to raise again follows on from what Ms. Ms. Fern said about delivery of larger strategic sites, infrastructure costs, brownfield sites. Um, the, the one key example I'd point to of the strategic sites coming through the plan, and we'll talk about ST1, British Sugar, um, when we get round to the specific site discussions. Um, the, the delivery of affordable housing that's factored into the Section 106 agreement for that recently permitted scheme is a baseline position of 3% affordable housing. So in horse racing parlance, unfortunately, the, the delivery of affordable housing from strategic sites has fallen at the first fence. Thank you. Just um, uh, Miss Macefield, I think this is probably for you. Um, one thing that um, I'm, well, I knew I was going to need to know it at some point, but um, it may be that I need to know, know this now or as part of um, the um, bit of homework 
um, that I've asked. Um, but what I'm not absolutely sure about, I don't think, um, is the situation in relation to sites that have been granted um, planning permission, which are also um, allocations um, in the plan. So in terms of the, the, the figures that you were going to give me, I know to, to strip out this averaging, this 25% actually telling me straight up whether it's 20 or 30, where um, that relates to a site that has planning permission and the level of affordable housing is something different to that. Will you reflect the, the, the reality for me, please? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Thank you. I, I hope what I'm about to say might help that last uh, question because uh, almost all the information we've got has come from the council. Um, uh, your Labour Party believes that the plan is not sound and that this item we're now discussing is the main reason. Um, the, the position as set out by GL Hearn uh, is very problematic to us and doesn't conform with the reality of what is happening on the ground. And we believe that the plan will not make a substantial um, uh, help to the uh, affordable homes situation. And the main reason is that the driver for the plan is not primarily the overall housing need, but the priority of the city to concentrate development onto brownfield sites and redu reduce the pressure on greenfield sites. We've looked over the last five years at the production of affordable homes. Uh, overall, the provision has run at around 11% uh, uh, from all sites and uh, on brownfield sites, the figure is 4%. And no significant size brownfield site in York has exceeded 10%. So I think it's, a, understand the question to Miss Macefield, but in fact, the reality has got nothing to do with the plan figures which are shown in the local plan uh, because they are not deliverable. and colleagues to my right have already said that. And our understanding from the social housing figures is that the net figures are actually negative for the last five years and uh, uh, at the very most break even. So there is no social housing provision. And there were some exchanges there which I didn't fully follow but certainly social rent has, has presented a very small percentage of all developments. This problem is exacerbated by the situation on York Central, which was mentioned earlier. York Central is providing 2,500 homes into the program, which is uh, the largest site by some distance. And in the outline planning application hearing, uh, earlier on this year, it was stated by the executive director of the city that it would not meet priority housing needs. Uh, as a result, we believe the plan is not sound as it, as it is here, and we advocate a return to the 867 eight, homes plus 10%, and also that there needs to be a rebalancing and de-risking of the plan so that the provision across brownfield and greenfield sites is in a better balance and where the percentage of affordable homes can be increased both by land provision and by other policies from the council. Thank you. Mr Keogh. Uh, thank Apologies. you, sir. Mr. Keogh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just to clarify, so your question is directed at the housing requirement, which I take it to be the 867 figure. Uh, the, the, the figure in the plan for which um, the council yes. has proposed a modification. Yes. That, uh, should I take it as, yeah, I, th I take it that that's the, fit, that's the 867 figure, which is the, the, the requirement figure that they're moving forward with relating to the, your previous question about 
Uh, it, well, uh, uh, in the submitted plan, um, the yeah. figure is um, 867, yeah. but the council has pr proposed a modification yeah. um, to, to that, to which is... Uh, 790 plus 30, what was it, 6, was it? I've forgotten there exactly. It's 822 eight two. altogether. Thank you. In which case, yeah, apolo my, must apologise. I've wrongly used the 790 OAN figure. I'm probably late, too late at night when I was doing this. But um, it never, nevertheless, it, it makes my uh, conclusions uh, worse in terms of the, the outcome for affordable housing. Uh, I won't repeat the points. Student housing has already been made. Uh, the point that student housing has been made. The point about... Um, the uh, British Sugar site, one of the largest sites in, in the plan, uh, delivering very low levels of affordable. The other um, issue that's going to challenge the delivery of affordable is the high reliance on windfall sites. Um, 2,197 2, windfall sites uh, over the plan period. Um, you can assume that a good proportion of those will be will fall into the less than uh, 10 unit uh, category and won't won't uh, won't won't deliver. Uh, affordable provision. Um, in terms of where we're starting from, uh, Mr. Grundy produced some figures that I, I've produced some figures in my submission as well, uh, taken from the council's website, uh, and using the council's figures for total affordable completions. Um, yeah, you're looking at figures of um, around nine, eight, nine, ten percent uh, for. 2017, 18, 2018, 19, in terms of that should delivery of affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secker. Thank you, sir. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, most of my points have already been made, so I think uh, just to reiterate from uh, uh, business members, uh, would share the concerns that have been echoed around the table about the uh, under delivery in recent years and question the uh, soundness of the plan and its ability to deliver much needed affordable housing for the city going forward. Mr Good. Thank you, sir. Um, similarly, a lot of my points have already been made as well. Um, the, on the only point I would reiterate is, is the Council's insistence that the 573 is still okay, given it's on a 2016 base date. That's three years after the HNU. Given that lower quartile affordability ratio has increased, and given that lower quartile rents have also increased significantly, it seems dubious that that would stay the same. I would have anticipated that would increase. And I'm using the council's own data here, but table 11 looks at rents, and I noticed that was something that Mr. Gardner specifically mentioned. And it says over the five years, it was a 14% increase on low quartile rentals. And that's the council's own evidence at table 11, sir. Mr. Natchez. Thank you. Very simply, in answer to your question, it's no, the Council haven't included anything. Um, it, it's clear from what we've heard already. On the note that's been done, I did just want to flag um, through if it could be picked up that the, the figure that was given of around about 3,500 extrapolated upwards would get you to 15,000 houses. And from a quick calculation, that's pretty much every house in the allocations. But we must be aware that some of them actually go beyond the plan period. I think there's about 1,500 homes that do. And at the moment, the 350, so the, the figure the council gave us in terms of what we'll deliver seems to be over every single allocation, as opposed to only those that will be delivered in the plan period. So I think the note would need to delineate what the level of affordable is, because there could be a further discrepancy and shortfall of about 350 houses if you look at that, what's being delivered post-2032. Yeah, um, just to ensure that, that doesn't happen if the note is quite clear about, about what's what, frankly. Yes, I, th I think this is going to be more than a paragraph. You might be right. I'd put money on it. And I, I will avoid making racing jokes. I'm fairly restrained so far. Um, yeah, 
Uh, there are a number of um, nameplates still upended. I, I assume you've just forgotten to put them down. Mr. Secker. Mr. Waters. Thank you, Inspector. Um, I've sat here for a while and I'm quite intrigued with this discussion because it is solely concentrating on the supply side. Now, if the plan goes forward generating 650 extra jobs a year in this city, bearing in mind there's a very low level of unemployment anyway, is it fair to assume, using ONS figures, that three quarters or two thirds or whatever figure they're using this week will be purely down to international inward migration? Is it therefore not true that we're importing an even greater affordable housing problem in York and shouldn't we be looking on that demand side of it to reduce the job growth to stop increasing the pressure on affordable housing? Thank you for that. Ah, I, I couldn't see your nameplate, actually. It's because uh, it's, it's a long story, and the short answer is that Carol's got it. OK. So I've, I've read it myself, and it's not the clearest, but it's Mr Butler. <laughs> and it, it was just a quick point, basically, to say that I think it's key, and it's a bit of a marker, it's key when we're talking about delivery and viability of strategic sites that we do differentiate between previous developed brownfield sites and greenfield sites. Um, that was just that point, really. Thank you. Okay, um, is there anything else on this side of the table before I um, look to the council for, for their reply and then move on? Very good. Well, I think we're going to deal with it in the note, if, if that's a convenient way to, to respond most of this. Uh, we've had a number of issues which have raised right by windfalls, deliverability, viability. They either go in the note or they are matters for phase two. Um, I can make, just as a point of information, York Central includes 20% affordable housing in line with the plan policy, but York Central is going to deliver um, 2,500 homes instead of the 1,700 originally planned, so we're likely to deliver more than anticipated. Um, and uh, I agree with the figure that was put out earlier. If, if you were to meet the affordable housing requirement in full, working on 30%, you'd have an OAN of nearly 2,000. But um, the specific points we will put in the note. Yeah, um, I, I think what I'm going to do on this then um, is to take the council's um, note, see what it says, and, and proceed from there. Yes. I mean, we we don't accept that we don't know what the need is. We've given you the figure whether or not there's an issue over the uh, the date of the schmar, but it's a five seven three figure. Um, the the point of the the point of uncertainty was how it, it split down in terms of the twenty five percent. So I don't accept the criticisms that were made that went overboard in terms of criticising the uncertainty. It's not that uncertain. And we do have the figures. It's just we don't have them to hand. OK, thank you. Are these second indications? Well, very, very briefly, um, because um, I, I do want to move on. And, and I would say... Um, affordable, this won't be the last time we talk about affordable housing during this examination. Um, so I, I don't want you to, um, yeah, I, I don't want you to dwell, um, well, I, I'm not going to dwell on it on it very much longer at all, but um, I'll hear from Mr. Grundy. He has been very patient all day, and, um, and, and also from Mr. Clark. I'm not sure about Mr. Natkus. He's had a fair, a fair bite already. Thank you, sir. It's been very quick points, just coming back on Mr Alvin's comments about York Central. Yes, it is down to deliver 20%, but also it will be backed by significant uh, Homes England growth funding. Mr Clark. Uh, very briefly, the 
20% is composed of a mix of social rent and uh, intermediate market uh, dwellings. And there is a difference between uh, providing a percentage of a site, even if it delivers the average, which is 4% for this kind of site, uh, between that and providing the kind of dwellings which are the council's highest priority and the, well, and the type. Good to say, it's an 80-20 the, split in this case. Sorry? It's the 80-20 split in this yes, case, 80% yes, social. It is, yeah, if it's delivered. <laughs> Uh, it was a verbatim statement from the executive director uh, of the council who said that the site would not provide for the highest priority needs and that would be provided on other sites. I, if you want me to sit through the five hours of the webcast, I'll find the quote for you. <laughs> um, if you would, Mr. Clark. Mr. Nankers. If we could have it by five o'clock, that would be very helpful. So the council's answer was a bit like the big QI buzzer that goes off because my point was about the ones beyond the plan period and York Central is that site because the plan says it will be now uplifted to two and a half thousand but then the policy explicitly says only 1500 in the plan period. So the extra numbered units shouldn't be in the note because actually they won't be coming forward. They're beyond the plan period. It's explicit in the policy. I wasn't responding to that point and... Uh... That will, get, that will be dealt with in the note. I was simply giving you, as a point of fact, what York Central is providing. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that there now. Uh, well, OK, Mr Waters. <coughs> Extremely brief, this one, but I, I must correct what the Council said about York Central. 20 years ago, when the development brief first came out and it was con so-called consultation with the York public, York Central was going to provide 3,000 dwellings and it was going to save all our greenbelt. Okay, I'm going to draw a line under it there. Um, which um, brings us back to um, question 2.5. So can I have a, a go at summarising our position and seeing if it gives rise to any issues? Um, the, the position is the 867 was uh, uh, an annual uh, was not an annual commitment uh, ditto the, the the current figure um, it's it's to be an average and if it's necessary to amend the policy to make that clear then so be it the plan period is to 2033 as you've heard um, and the uh, issue about uh, some provision being after the plan period, that is, as I've already explained, a result of the larger sites, strategic sites, delivering beyond the plan period. It provides flexibility and headroom. It's not a question of seeking to make the development plan policies apply after the event, as it were. Um, the 867 and uh, OAN figures have been explained now. Uh, and for the same reason that I've just given with regard to C, we say it doesn't undermine Greenbelt justification. Those sites have to be released in any event to meet the OAN figure. It's simply that they will deliver more after the plan period, but it provides resilience in terms of Greenbelt boundaries for the longer term, and that's a matter that can be explored further next week. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, as I think you, you hinted, um, Mr. Elvin, um, this isn't something that other people so much, um, at least, have, have picked upon, but the, if, this, this was something that frankly struck me um, when, when, when I um, looked um, at the plan. I mean, f first of all, it should be a net figure, shouldn't it? The, 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 yes. The 867 um, or whatever figure it is that goes in through the modification that you've put forward, that should be a net figure. Yes. That, that being so, frankly, I think the policy should say it. Uh, um, I agree. And, and if, it's an, if it's an annual average figure, again, um, I think the policy should say that. I agree. So do I take that as... Um, An invitation to yeah, um, advance modifications, yes. What, what I'll do is take it that the council is um, putting forward two main modifications, well, or, or one, however you want to... 
Yeah. Certainly to modify SS1. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's this business about the plan period. Um, I don't know if it's just me. I, mean, I, 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 know, I, know, I know why you're doing it. I understand the reasons why the council is proposing to do this. Um, but I, I'm kind of sort of strug struggling conceptually. Um, and that's, well, it's not something I've ever seen before. Um, and I've been doing this job a little while. Um, and I, I kind of wonder, frankly, why you don't just include the sites anyway, um, but have the plan period ending at 2033. That would still achieve no, the same. That is, that, is, that, is the perp that is the proposal. Well, well there, there's this, this thing called a post-plan period, isn't there? Have I got it wrong? That, it is perhaps not expressed well. If, if, you, if, if you have these concerns, the plan period should be to 2033, and this mm. is simply delivery post-plan period. And again, if you think that needs clarification and you mm. appear to do so, then we would invite a modification. I, I, I think it does, um, I have and to say. I mean, I, I'm quite, quite used to seeing plans um, that have sites that will deliver in part yeah. during the plan well, period, but in part well, after. Well, that, that's, that, that's what's intended, and if it's been poorly okay. expressed, we invite a modification to deal with that. I, I, I think um, it is a main modification for soundness in relation to effectiveness. Yes. Um, so if we could have, and I think what that means, um, is removing from the policy, um, certainly, and very possibly elsewhere, references to this, this, this post-plan period, but not to lose the explanation about delivery after 2033. You might need modification to the explanatory text to say yeah. some of these sites will delivery, deliver beyond the plan period and that will provide extra resilience and flexibility, etc. Which is the, the purpose of the thing in the first place. So that being um, so, then the plan period um, is 2017 to 2033. Correct, sir. <clears throat> Anything from anyone else on that? Very good. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Two point five D. Um, do, do we have a housing requirement figure that's higher than the yes. OAN? Eight two two. It can go in the same modification to SS one that deals with the uh, the other issues we've uh, discussed. Um, and that is a question of addressing shortfall. Yes. Over and above the OAN. Yes. So if I could, if, if I could say it's, it's OAN plus shortfall, in yes. effect. makes a lot more sense to me now, um, which, which, which may um, mean that we have to spend no time at all, for, for my part, at least on 2.5e. Good. Well, that, I, I couldn't quite work out, frankly, no, no, what was no, going no, on. No, 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 uh, when, uh, I, which is why I thought we would just, uh, we yeah. could deal with it shortly yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and deal with your concerns. Um, is this um, of interest to anyone else? Do I have any indications? I've got my glasses on. Uh, again, Mr. Austin Fell. Mr. Austin Fell. Uh, just a, a small and discreet point. Um, I, I too was slightly um, 
lost when sort of going through the, the different sort of sequence of what is a requirement and what is an, an OAN. I'm very sorry, Mr. Osser, I, I, I couldn't hear you then. I'll try again, sir. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear now. Um, just sort of turning to the Council's response under item D, um, it's, it's perhaps a, an issue that can be resolved through main modification, but it, it's, it's again the clarification of what is need and what is requirement, because there seems to be the indication here that the, the 790 OAN operates um, up to, uh, sorry, on the period up to now, whereas the, the requirement of 822 captures that shortfall. Uh, now, in reality, you know, the, the component of that shortfall is the OAN. So we're talking here about dealing with the shortfall um, over the remainder of the... No, 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 sorry. Um, you've completely lost me. Have another go. Have another go, sir. Th this matter, sir, in my mind, uh, sort of deals with the delivery of the shortfall. So this is talking about how the shortfall that has accrued to date will be delivered over the remainder of the plan period. And we're straying on to delivery territory here, which is going to be yeah, something... Yeah, we are, that's and, and that's why I'm not, I'm not asking the questions today. Not a problem, sir, but I think, I think there just needs to be that clarification of, of OAN versus requirement, because the two are separate matters. Uh, and in my mind, it needs to be the, the 790, and when they come to address the shortfall, that is a, a supply mechanism through the five-year land supply. Ah, hmm. Mm, I don't think we agree with that. Mr. Alvin? We see that as a calculation of the requirement which needs to go into the plan, not simply a five-year delivery point. Sir, so, Sarah May, just another point, and I, I hasten to sort of stray onto it, but there are factors that relate to the implementation of this plan which will become relevant under MPPF3 and in terms of maintaining the Council's five-year land supply, um, this would become a, a relevant factor in terms of the short uh, I, Is that what we're calling it now, by the way, NPPF3? Uh, if you prefer. <laughs> Ten PPF two and a half if you're going to do that. Yeah. Perhaps it's one I, for another day, I, I, sir, I, I, I know full well what you're referring to, um, yes. but I'm not going to pick that up um, today. Um, there will be things that inevitably um, get revisited um, as the, the, the hearings progress. There's, there's frankly nothing I can do to, to avoid that. It, it's difficult because, I, well, oh, good grief, this is going to be another bad analogy, but, um, uh, you know, I get given a pizza and I, ha I have to sort of slice it up to be able to deal with it, but um, I don't see the whole pizza again until the end of the process. Um, so I will inevitably have to pick up um, things that we've discussed today um, again as we, uh, as we go through because I'll be talking about things like, as you point out, five-year housing land supply um, during, during phase two. Thank you, sir. I'm glad that's going to be captured. I don't want to talk any more on supply today. I think, uh, frankly, everyone would be <laughs> very much put out, but um, I'm glad to hear that it'll be something captured later on. Thank you. Um, yes, and, and unless I'm grievously mistaken, um, d does that bring us um, to the end of today's session? Is there anything else from anyone else, last chance saloon, before I adjourn for the day? Mr. Robinson. Did, did, did you want everyone to actually say what they thought the OAM actually was? Sorry, did, did you want anyone, any feedback as to what um, people thought the house requirement actually was for York? I'm not sure we've actually discussed that at all. I, I know we're all the time, it's five o'clock, but um, is that something you wanted to hear or you're happy that uh, it's in everyone's evidence? Yeah, that's, um, that, that's 2.7, isn't it? My question 2.7. Um, uh, uh, sadly, I think Mr. Robinson's right. Um, I, I haven't covered issue two point or question 2.7, and I wouldn't wouldn't deny him um, the, the opportunity to deal with that now. 
I, I got carried away for, for a moment. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Very quickly then, because I'm sure everyone's tired. But um, I mean, section seven of our, um, our technical statement sets out the stages that we thought should have been gone through. Just summarising very quickly the points that I've made earlier. The demographic base, I mean, first of all, I don't agree that it's 790, rather obviously. I feel that the council should have considered issues such as the international migration. We've done our own modelling. When you do that, you apply the major estimates. That's the most recent 2018 major estimates. You apply the um, adjustment for international migration. That gets you towards a demographic starting point of around 920. Um, if it, yeah, I mean, it is a quicker, well, a more, okay. frankly, a clearer way of looking at this. Because, I mean, ob obviously, if I were to accept your points in mm. relation to the OAN, um, that would have an inevitable and unavoidable knock-on effect in relation to the plan requirement. So I suppose the key point is, um, if I were to accept um, your OAN figure, for example, um, would there, in your view, be anything that ought to be added to that um, in order to, to, to reach a plan requirement? Yeah, so I, I think you go through those stages. You if you do accept my point on the, the demographic baseline, the market signals adjustment, which we've talked about, you know, I think we, we feel it's at least 20%. And those other points about the student housing, um, the affordable housing, we came to a, a figure of around 1,300 dwellings per annum, which was our figure, which sounds high, but if you put it in the context of what the government is trying to achieve, where it's trying to deliver 300,000 homes per annum, that would require every district in the country to deliver roughly 1.3% every year of their current housing stock. Now, that figure for York is actually 1,150 dwellings per annum, just to contextualise that. And bear in mind the discussion we've had about the special case for York, about the market signals, the students and everything else. You know, when you put it alongside how that fits in what the government wants us to do, it's a heck of a big way from what the, the council is suggesting at 790. All of which is in the hearing statement. Mr. Corsier. So I make very brief points. Of course, the OAN is not the end of the road in terms of the housing requirement. You have to carry out the exercise carried out, set out in MPPF 14, and look at the potential harm. I must obviously that's not for today. That's. We'll start that on matter three, but clearly Greenbelt is not the only matter where potential harm can be. It can be in terms of, for example, air quality, congestion, and all these other items which we'll deal with in other hearings. So, so I, I just don't want it to be thought this is the end of the road on housing requirement. Um, if, if I've given the impression that I thought it was, um, I, I apologize. Mr. Clark. Anything from the council's side, Mr. Elvin? Yeah, I don't have anything else either, um, which means um, unless there's anything else from anyone else, it, no, in, in which case um, I adjourn the hearing to resume um, in this room on Monday morning, this is right, isn't it? Uh, Monday morning at nine o'clock. Thank you.